to Explore Classroom. My name is Vivette Dukes. I'm an English educator and a lifelong learner, and I am so glad that you're joining us today. Many of our viewers have returned to school in the last couple of weeks. How exciting, yay, back to school. We hope you're getting a great year started, and we're so happy that you include National Geographic education in your experiences. At National Geographic, we use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Explorer Classroom connects students worldwide with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. That's my favorite part. Yes, I love it. This school year, each month will be organized around a specific time. This September, Explorer Classroom will be exploring different ecosystems and the importance of conservation. Today, our explorer is none other than Nigel Golden. Woohoo! Nigel is an ecologist, a conservationist, who focuses on studying the Arctic brrr, and how it is changing. Today, he's going to help us better understand Arctic, Arctic ecosystems, how they are impacted by climate change, and why conservation is so important. But before we get really into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome all of our registered viewers who join us today from around the globe. Yes, we are global, baby. Special shout outs for today go to Mohawk Elementary in Texas, woohoo! Oak Cliff Elementary in Georgia, Give it up for Oak Cliff Elementary, Westchester Friends School in Pennsylvania, shout out, St. John Catholic School, all the way in Canada, wonderful, the International School of Geneva in Switzerland, and the Fox family and all of our home schools out there, shout out to you, we're thrilled to have all of you here. And with that, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. It's time to turn it over to Nigel to share all about the Arctic. Take it away, Nigel. Hi, everyone. Um, I think that folks should be able to see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up to get some confirmation? OK, awesome. Um, I'm so excited to be here and be able to present for you all. Um, like Vivette said, my name is Nigel Golden. Um, I got, have a PhD in environmental conservation. Um, and the current institution that I work in right now is the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And one of the practices that we gauge in is beginning with a land acknowledgement statement. Um, and so working from the Woodwell Climate Research Center, we're located on the traditional and sacred land of the Wampanoag people who still occupy that land and whose history, language, and traditional ways of life and culture continue to influence the vibrant community. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a kid from an urban area in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and growing up, I did not have a lot of connections with the environment. Um, there's some historical context there, right? Um, and that may be true for a lot of the folks who are viewing this. Um, for my family, they were scared of the outdoors. And so I really wasn't able to cultivate experiences with the environment um, until my undergrad. So that's the picture that you're seeing um, all the way to the left of me holding a black bear that's kind of about halfway asleep. Um, this experience as an undergrad in wildlife ecology research and management then led me to graduate school where I did a PhD. I was studying Arctic ground squirrels in Denali National Park. That's the picture in the middle leading me up to the picture to the right, where I'm now a postdoc at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And I'm doing research in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta with nine other students um, who are all phenomenal students as well. Um, and so this is just a little bit about me and the trajectory of my work. I'm in my personal time. I also like to go hiking. I like to read. Um, my favorite author is Octavia Butler. Um, she's really awesome. So for folks who wanna look up her work some more, 
um, there's an option to do that. So I have a pop quiz for everyone who is viewing the stream. Um, fortunately, you're not being graded for it. So it hopefully it's not too uh, stressful. Um, and so the first question that I have for everyone is, which of these pictures represent Arctic habitat? So there are five options to choose from, A, B, C, D, and E. You can even choose multiple options out of these if you so wish. And so I'll, I'll give folks a couple of moments here and uh, we'll see what's happening in the chat and what your responses are. Okay, Westchester says all. Okay, Miss Lee's class also says all. What about X Venture? All okay, and then we're seeing on YouTube there's quite a few answers saying all or all but E. Okay, I'm like so excited about these answers. If you answered all of them, you are correct. Um, all of these individual images are pictures taken from the Arctic. Um, this is phenomenal. I I feel like in the public's imagination, right? Um, most of the what they see or what they think about the Arctic is limited to sea ice, snow, and polar bears. Um, and that's not actually the case. Rather, it's populated by a diverse range of different plant communities. So this picture here, um, I'm standing in the foreground in front of the picture. Um, it's taken out of Denali National Park, which is in the interior of Alaska. It's about the size of the state of Maine. I'm standing on Igloo Mountain, which is opposite of Cathedral Mountain. So that's the mountain that you see in the background there. I um, mean, this is during the summer of 2018. And so starting from the valley, so the low point in this picture, right, where you can kind of see a road or stream. Um, and as we move up in elevation, so we move up that mountain, um, the area that is higher than the surrounding land, um, we can see a transition in plant communities from forest to alpine tundra, Tundra is a type of habitat that does not contain trees because it is too high of elevation. I mean, in this picture, I'm standing about 4,500 feet. And for comparison's sake, right, this is almost four times taller than the Empire State Building in New York. So if you've been there and you've seen the building, you know exactly how tall that is. Uh, well, in comparison, this is quite taller. So if the Arctic is more than just snow and ice, right, what exactly is it? Um, it turns out there's many criteria we can use to define what the Arctic is. Um, many scientists refer to anything north of the Arctic Circle. Um, this is a line of latitude about 66.5 degrees north of the equator. Um, latitude being a measurement of distance north or south of the equator. The equator, which is an imaginary line, divides the Earth into uh, the northern and southern uh, hemisphere. And so in this image to the right here, the Arctic Circle is outlined in red. And so using this geographical definition, so its position relative to other landforms on the planet, um, everything within that circle is, is, is the Arctic Circle. It's considered part of the Arctic. And so we have Iceland, we have Greenland, we have parts of Russia, we have parts of Canada, and we have parts of Alaska as well. This is a rather simple definition, right? Um, and so some other criteria that we can use is based off the ecology, so the relationships between habitats um, and potential animals in their environment. Um, and so one other definition or one other criteria that we use is dividing the Arctic landmass into three different zones. And so that's what this figure to the right is showing you as well. Um, there's a high Arctic, which you're probably more familiar with. Those are the polar bears, the sea ice um, and snow. Uh, particularly so during the winter. 
um, the low Arctic and the subarctic. And so uh, for this definition, it is the climate, so the prevailing weather conditions and vegetation that determines the division of these zones. So for instance, the subarctic in the subarctic, excuse me, the major habitat consists of what we call taiga, right? Um, and this is composed of boreal forests. So these are forests in the north. So think of pine trees, spruces, and larches. Another definition that we can use here is based off of the spiritual and cultural systems from indigenous peoples who have lived in reciprocal relationships. So this is a practice of mutual care as a simple definition with these lands for thousands of years pre-colonialism. Um, and so, you know, even then that doesn't feel comprehensive enough. Um, what I think does feel comprehensive enough, however, um, are based on definitions that include all three of these. Um, and one that includes all three of these things, the geography, the ecology, and the people who live there um, are based off of changes, right? And so the changes that are happening in the Arctic leading to the new emergence of relationships. So this is from the spiritual and cultural systems, climate and vegetation. Um, and that would be climate change. So the earth is warming. This is collectively referred to as climate change. Some of you may have some personal experience with this or learned about it in your classrooms. Um, what you should know is that this warming is occurring in Arctic as well, so much so that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Um, and so this figure here shows warming as elevation. We just talked about elevation, right? Um, so the more warming there is, the taller it is by comparison um, for the other geographical places um, on this figure. Um, and so my question here is, you know, like where do folks see the most warming occurring? If you can put that in the chat. Or is there anything else that's really cool and stands out to you? Yeah, the northern places have the highest amount of warming. The, it looks to be much more so elevated in comparison to the other land masses, right? So we see examples of the United States and South America. We see Africa. We see Australia. Yeah, like most of that concentration of warming is happening in the north there, in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, exactly. The higher the darker. That's really awesome. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, yeah, so we've established the most warming is occurring in the Arctic. Um, and what I really want to pull out from this is that, um, and, or at least one of the large consequences for this, is that rising temperatures in the Arctic are thawing grounds. Um, and these are grounds that are historically frozen year round, or what we refer to as permafrost. Um, and so in this image here, um, there's an example of permafrost. Um, it's that lower section of the soil profile. And what we have on top is the active layer. So the permafrost is the ground, right, that's remained frozen for two or more years. Um, and this is found anywhere where temperatures are low enough underground to stay below freezing. Um, and this is pretty common in the Arctic, as you can see from the figure on the right. And so um, what this uh, figure is meant to show you is the coverage of permafrost or how distributed it is across the Arctic. And so we see that Arctic circle there, right? And permafrost is happening within that Arctic circle, but it's also happening outside of that Arctic circle as well. So we see permafrost having a very extensive distribution across Alaska, across the Northern territories of Canada, and then across Northeast Russia as well. So what you can see is that most of the land in the north is covered with this permafrost. Um, and so there's an even more thin layer on top of that where the soil freezes and thaws based on the season. So that's that active layer. During the summer, it melts. There's no ice there. And then during the winter, there is ice there. 
um, the consideration here is that when this soil thaws, the entire landscape can change with some very deep consequences. And so um, something to compare this to, right, is the reduction of sea ice and how it impacts polar bears. And so what are some potential consequences of this frozen, of this frozen ground thawing due to climate change? So there are consequences for non-human Arctic inhabitants. This is a species I study in Denali National Park called the Arctic ground squirrel. Um, besides being really cute, they're really awesome. They have a whole Arctic distribution, meaning you can find them distributed in Alaska, Canada, and Northeast Siberia. They live in these burrows, these colonial burrows that can host up to 50 individuals. Um, and they're actually true hibernators. They're almost completely inactive during the winter so inactive so that they can appear dead, right? They reach the lowest body temperature of any mammal recorded during hibernation to the point of almost freezing. I um, mean, they're also really important to the habitats that they live in. So while I was in Denali National Park doing work, they were being eaten by grizzly bears, they were being eaten by red foxes, they were being eaten by golden eagles. Um, they're, they're a pretty high main source of food for a lot of animals in the habitats that they live in. And because they are adapted to the cold temperatures, there's some concern about their ability to adapt to warming temperatures. Um, there are also consequences as well for the Arctic indigenous peoples as well. Um, and so in this case, I'm referring to Alaskan natives. That's what this figure is showing you. Um, and they have a rich and complex history in these environments. Um, and they have developed lifestyles that enable them to live sustainably in permafrost lands. Um, there's about 11 distinct groups that can be described geographically, right? So based on how they're located around Alaska, um, but they're also defined as well by their, language, by their language groups, which is shown in this image. The homes that they build on top of from permafrost can be ripped apart as the land thaws around them. And the animals that are adapted to cold temperatures that have lived in the Arctic um, are also threatened by warming temperatures. And these are the very animals that sustain their communities being impacted as well. Um, and so the consequences for warming in the Arctic is not just relegated to the non-humans, the animals and peoples that live there, but the consequences for all of us, um, what, just, what happens in the Arctic doesn't just stays there. So permafrost not only contains ice, but it also contains carbon as well. And so when permafrost thaws, it releases more carbon into the atmosphere. And so that's what this figure is uh, trying to show you in the lower right. Um, and this can cause the atmosphere and the world to warm more. So scientists like myself and my colleagues and my students are studying potentially how much carbon is coming out of these landscapes. So the picture on the top is um, in the Yukon Kusinkum Delta. This is a peatland tundra um, where there's a lot of carbon potentially locked up underneath that soil. Um, and we're kind of studying potentially how much is being distributed out of there when the permafrost thaws. Um, I've been very grateful that my work um, has happened almost across Alaska. So I've done work in Denali National Park, which I've related to there. That's the red circle that's kind of almost in the middle of the map. Um, I've also done work in the Yukon Kusum Delta. That's where I'm at now. This is the red circle that's kind of to the lower bottom on the left. Um, and then I've also done in north of the Brooks Range, which is happening almost in the very small north. That's where that red circle is at. So you're probably wondering, right? There's all of this warming happening in the Arctic. There's consequences for the beings that live there. There's consequences for us. Um, what exactly can you do? Um, first and foremost, you can start with learning about the land that you live on. So we, I started this talk off with the land acknowledgement statement. I spoke a little bit about the indigenous people, Alaskan natives that live in the Arctic. Um, there are also indigenous peoples on the land that you live on as well, who have taken on stewardship or really deep care about the lands that we live on. And so a really great place to start from is learning about them and the work that they have done on those landscapes. And once you learn more about the people who live there, actually go outside and make your own observations and be curious yourself, right? Um, and I think from there, you know, if you are interested, and this is the path that I took, is become a scientist 
I was exactly in your position. I remember distinctly being seven years old, watching shows like National Geographic, watching shows like the Discovery Channel, and imagining myself working in those environments. And here I am working on environmental issues that are deeply important to me and starting off with learning about the land that you live on, going outside and being curious and being involved is one of those steps that you can use to get there. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Wow, thank you, Nigel. This was such an incredible look into your work and why conserving Arctic habitats is so important. I bet many of our viewers are interested in joining your mission. So could you review how we can support your work in our communities? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think having conversations about the changes that are happening in your communities, right, um, are a very straightforward way of to potentially supporting my work. So um, you, the conversation about the Arctic and climate change in the Arctic and conservation in the Arctic is deeply related to the changes that are happening in your community. So alongside having conversations about the changes that are happening in your community, you can also learn more about the Arctic. You can learn about the changes that are happening in the tropics. You can learn about the changes that are happening in other places as well. And that deeply supports the work of not only myself, but all of the other scientists, all of the other activists, all of the other people who live with and are adapting to those changes. And so I will say learn, be curious and be in awe. Thank you again, Nigel, for taking the time to share your work with us today. And thank you to all of the students and teachers for bringing National Geographic into your classrooms. Happy back to school once again and happy National Hispanic and Latin American Heritage Month. National Geographic recognizes the many generations of Hispanic and Latinx people who have made and continue to make countless contributions to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. I hope that you join many more of our e events. We'll be right back here next Thursday, September 29th with environmentalist Vladi Russo and ecologist Rob Taylor to learn about the importance of freshwater ecosystems and the work they do supporting the Okavango Wilderness Project. And next Wednesday, September 28th, we're kicking off a special series of four events from the exploration vessel Nautilus during its expedition in the Hawaiian Islands. For the first session, we'll be joined by the Marine Mammal Team led by National Geographic Ex Explorer Matthias Hoffman-Kunt to learn how they will conduct acoustic recordings of the underwater soundscape from Maui and Hawaii Island to learn how noise pollution generated by humans impacts marine life. Wow, that like that is so cool. I'm definitely going to join in. Teachers, register for more than one event in this series for a chance to win a special prize for your classroom. Woohoo! Who doesn't want a special prize, right? Be sure to register for this event and more at natgeoed.org forward slash explorer classroom. You can request an on-screen spot for a chance to be featured up here on screen like our awesome classes today. Teachers, we've also created a new interactive guide for you to share with your students to take them on a learning journey with each of our explorers. Find the Explorer Mindset and Action Guide and Teacher Edition linked on each event registration page. Have a great day, everyone. It's been my pleasure to be with you today. And remember, stay curious and keep exploring.